Let's go. You lead the way. Where are we headed? Towards a net zero future, of course. Cleaner water, more electricity, a sustainable society. That's the destination we've set ourselves. This, we know. Yes, we know exactly where we're going, but we need to get there quicker. So, let's build on the progress we've already made by working and walking together. With the right partners, tools and ideas, we'll become an unstoppable force. This, we know. Right now, there are businesses who are putting technology and sustainability at the heart of everything they do. Brave leaders turning maybes into realities and building something better for everyone. Now is the time to look to the future and reinvent ourselves today, empowering others to do the same tomorrow. Yes, we know what the future holds and we know how to get there. So let's take charge of the journey today. School board meeting. Hello and welcome to the London Academy of Excellence and to the latest stage of the World Education Week. Uh, we hope you're enjoying the sessions, learning a great deal from uh, colleagues around the world. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, our, our school's approach to supporting mental health and well-being. Uh, you're going to hear most importantly from a panel of uh, young leaders from our mental health network, who you can see on the screen uh, next to me, uh, Ilham, Calvin, and Sashima. Also from our deputy head teacher, Ben Webster, who has been foundational and important in the development of this strategy. But first, before we do that, uh, my name is Alex Crossman. I'm the I have the rare privilege of being the head of this uh, of this extraordinary institution, and I'm just going to give you some context uh, about the LAE, uh, its mission, what it stands for, and and where in the world we are. So. 
Uh, LAE is a post-16 school, which means we're responsible for young people from the ages of 16 to 19, which in the UK system means that we're really preparing them for university uh, or uh, less commonly uh, direct entry into the world of work. Uh, and we are a highly academic school. In fact, we are academically selective at entry. Uh, but having said that, uh, and I suspect this is a theme that you will hear throughout uh, World Ed Education Week, certainly you've heard it uh, today from schools like Samaritan Mission School and from St. Edward's Primary School, we're also a highly inclusive environment. Uh, and what I mean by that could be expressed in many different ways, but just to think about schools that are broadly like ours, uh, sixth form colleges in sort of UK education parlance with, uh, with selective admissions criteria. If you were to look at the typical such institution in the UK and you would look at, to look at this school, uh, you would find that we have in a typical year about 10 times the number of students who've come from backgrounds where they have had to rely upon free school meals at one point or another in their education. Uh, and that point is vitally important to understanding our context. Uh, we're based here in the east end of London, uh, which if you are from outside the UK, may be familiar primarily from sort of Gothic novels, Jack the Ripper, that sort of thing. Uh, but if you're a little closer, have a little more familiarity with uh, this part of London, you'll know that it is extremely uh, culturally and ethnically diverse. There's a real richness of cultural experience in this part of London, it's a very dynamic part of London. Uh, it is also, uh, in, 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 less positive, in a less positive sense, it's the part of London with the highest incidence of child poverty, which also means it's the highest incidence of child poverty in the UK. Uh, so it's, a, it's an area which has uh, some incredible assets, some incredible positives, uh, but also some quite significant challenges. Uh, and those challenges are things that we meet, we meet directly as part of our provision, uh, including through some of the strategies that you're about to hear about. Now, uh, if you'll indulge me just for a moment longer so that I can show off on behalf of my institution, uh, LAE was founded a decade ago. This is our this is our, our 10th anniversary uh, and we were founded in order to address uh, the the absence of genuinely world class post 16 education in this part of London. Just 10 years ago, when the school first opened its doors, a, a very tiny number of students. And by that, I mean single digit numbers of students were progressing from Newham State Secondary Schools uh, to, uh, let's just say, the more prestigious universities in the UK, those in what we would consider to be something called the Russell Group. Uh, in the course of the last 10 years, which really means eight years worth of results, uh, given the way in which the exam system in this country works, uh, the London Academy for Excellence, just as a standalone institution, has sent more than 150 students to Oxford or Cambridge, uh, more than 200 students to medical schools, uh, and a staggering 1,350 students to, stu to Russell Group universities, as well as uh, universities around the world, most notably in the, U in the US, but also elsewhere. So a really dramatic transformation in the life chances of young people from this part of, Lo of London and from young people uh, with no, no experience of higher education in the family in particular. Now, why, why am I telling you all of that? Uh, other than because it's I'm a moderator and it's my job. Uh, I'm telling you all of that because that, that transformation, that, those achievements would not be possible uh, without taking exceptionally seriously uh, the well-being, uh, in particular the well-being of our young people. So although uh, we are an unashamedly academic school, we are very definitely driven by results, it's also the case that we offer a broad-based holistic education uh, and that that holistic education, which the students will talk to you about, uh, and some of the strategies around student leadership that they will talk to you about, those things are absolutely fundamental to driving success. Uh, we do not believe that there is a choice to be made here between a broad and enriching education and, and pastoral care and high standards of academic achievement. To the contrary, we think that's a, a fundamentally false choice uh, and that it's only through pursuing both that we can really allow young people to thrive and to succeed. So the other factor that I'm just gonna to touch upon briefly, the strategies you'll hear about today were for the most part embedded in the school's systems and culture before the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic and successive lockdowns designed to combat that pandemic. 
But I think it is unquestionably true that for all of us as educators, the pandemic has brought home and given an increased urgency to concerns around adolescent mental health and well-being in particular. Uh, and it's vitally important that the strategies that we've pursued here have been able to uh, enable us to meet that challenge and indeed for our young people to thrive throughout this period of time, this difficult period of time. So rather than going on any greater length, I'm going to pause there. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to our student panel, uh, who will talk you through their respective roles and some elements of the strategies that we've pursued. And I think I'm handing first to Ilham. Ilham, would you like to introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little more about the work you've been doing? Um, hi, I'm Ilham. I'm one of the current leaders of the Mental Health Network. Um, just to start off, the Mental Health Network is one of the longest running student led networks in our school and has provided the school with many benefits in such an academically rigorous environment. Their network is set up in a way that allows the students to be the fundamental catalysts for change in the school community. Um, by doing this, we create an environment of support for students as they understand that we're in the same position that they're in. And so we can relate to their problems in a str and struggles in a way that other people might not be able to. Through this, we can give the best advice on situations, some advice which teachers or senior members of staff may not be able to give, as well as creating a safe environment for the students. We also help the teachers as, as well to provide appreciation throughout the year and thank them for all the support and effort they put in day in and day out. The shared vision of the MHN is to challenge stigma surrounding conversations of mental health and create a more supportive environment between students and teachers. It is our belief that all students should be supported by, for positive mental health and help identify and respond to barriers that may exist to make this happen. We also believe that our work to break down the stigma surrounding mental health should include the wider community as well as LAE. The network has helped, has helped me develop personally through the way in which it's allowed, ha allowed me to express more empathy and compassion and allowed me to bring about education on topics pertaining to mental health, which I felt like weren't really spoken in communities I'd been in before. We understand that a good mental health is at the forefront of everything that we do in our lives. And to understand that by educating ourselves on mental health, we can live better lives. To implement this idea into our network, we send out weekly well-being tips in our school's newsletter. This includes tips on activities or habits that students can adopt into their daily lives to improve general health and well-being. Examples of things we've spoken about are things like drinking water regularly, meditation and engaging in a sport. We've also created a monthly teacher toolkit where we provide a student lens on experience at school that we share with all the teachers. This may include things such as what it's like, what the school is like for the teachers and also um, what it's like to live with a mental health illness and motivational talks. Following the COVID-19 pandemic, we understood more so than ever the impact that having a mental health network in our school environment can have on the students and made sure to ensure that everyone felt as though they are part of the community. This sense of community is reflected in the annual events that we run, such as Appreciation Day, Personal Development Day, where both the staff and students come together and do good for their mental health. Thank you, Ilham. I mean, that, that's fascinating. I mean, and you've, you've, you've illustrated a couple of points that I know we're going to pick up as we continue to talk, in particular, the extent to which uh, mental health and wellbeing strategies are really uh, baked into fundamental to all of the systems and processes by which we run the school more generally. Um, on that point, I probably should have mentioned earlier on that, of course, uh, uh, viewers from around the world can pose questions, which we'll attempt to take at the end of, uh, of this session. So if you're able to post those, those questions via whichever platform you're currently using to view uh, this, uh, this session, uh, then we'll try and pick those up uh, at the end of the session. With that, I'm going to hand over to Calvin, uh, and I'm just going to allow people uh, in uh, viewing from around the world to, to, to give a particular shout out because Calvin, uh, Calvin had to step into this role at very, very short notice uh, when Laurent, his colleague, uh, was unfortunately taken ill this morning. So, uh, so Calvin, uh, thank you very much and, uh, and over to you. Hello. Um, so I'm going to be building upon what Ilham was speaking about and talk through the specific mechanisms that our mental health network uses to bring about our vision. So an important day for us yearly is the annual personal development day where we're responsible for creating a series of workshops, trips, activities, visiting speakers on the theme of mental health that all students can attend. And we create a menu of activities which are mainly run by ourselves and our students select their, their preferences for what they want to do. Um, and as students, we come up for the ideas ourselves and we run these workshops to include uh, well-being activities such as mindfulness and journaling, as well as education spaces where 
students can understand the complexities and of mental health, especially as we're adolescents from experts. So we also run campaigns across the year, uh, raising awareness on mental health and speak regularly in our weekly assemblies as a space to educate the student body as a collective. So for example, with men's mental health, we try to deconstruct the stigma surrounding uh, men's mental health and uh, teach students to uh, deal with uh, voicing their opinions, especially during silent suffering. And uh, we show short movies to show how people may be suffering despite uh, saying that they're okay and how important it is to voice our opinions and providing a safe space for this. Uh, this allowed a friend of mine to safely speak about uh, his ADHD and how it makes him feel. Another important annual event for us is Appreciation Day. So this is a day where we create a number of different ways uh, to appreciate our classmates, friends, and even teachers to uh, write messages and prepare uh, gifts for them. And uh, we, in our common room, we had a wall set up and people wrote personal letters and pieces of praise to other students and even teachers for everyone to walk by and feel welcome and happy. And uh, I think this is important because uh, this allows uh, our students to uh, give a platform for advocating the importance of mental health and creating a culture of kindness and support whilst being so. Thank you, Kevin, again, thank you for, for stepping in. I mean, you made a really important point there about, about men's mental health, but of course, uh, in, in, in there are many, there are people in many contexts uh, sort of viewing this particular broadcast and uh, we should probably remember that it's, it's not only, uh, it's not only men who have difficulty talking about their mental health. Uh, there are also clearly other communities, uh, other, other faith groups that may find an open, frank and supportive conversation on some of these topics more challenging. So maybe that's something we could explore through the Q&A later. All right, thank you for that. I'm going to hand over from Calvin to Sushima. Sushima, uh, you're up next. Uh, so hello, uh, I'm the Wellbeing Ambassador. So the Wellbeing Ambassadors run parallel with the Mental Health Network in being student leaders who are working to enhance the mental health of students in our school. And as Wellbeing Ambassadors, we work alongside the school staff to develop new approaches to support students' wellbeing and mental health. Um, so the Wellbeing Ambassadors are selected every year and begin their program with an intense training module on what adolescents' mental health is. Um, in order to become an ambassador, you need to fill out, uh, go through an application process which involves filling out an application form um, detailing what your motivations are for the role. And as ambassadors, I think also for us, it's vital that we are aware of strategies to mon monitor and take care of our own well-being. Uh, so in the beginning, we completed a thorough training on how to approach discuss discussion around dealing with mental uh, well-being issues. For example, it was made very clear about the importance of being non-judgmental and empathetic. Um, therefore, when I first started the role, we focused on going through practices that an online platform called Selfology provides. Um, for example, we went through uh, things around mo meditation and rumination, and we were also given free access to the program. So how the program runs is that we look at current research and understanding this to becoming quickly well informed about the current trends and challenges. We then engage in in-depth research to the mental health of the current students by running a well-being survey and conducting focus groups with a range of different students. Once we analyze their responses, we narrow down the most prominent issues that come up. And naturally, as a quite an academic school, stress about grades and learning was expectedly at the top of the list. Um, arising out of this research, we then formulate ideas on a series of different interventions that we could or we feel that might, may have the most impact in the school. Um, from here, a little bit of problem solving was required uh, when trying to brainstorm what possible solutions we could implement. And considering the limitations that we had in terms of scope and time, we grouped the ideas into four main categories of high maintenance, low maintenance, small impact and large impact. We then created a proposal of these initiatives that we were planning to, plan to present to the school's senior leadership team. And one such initiative that we believe will have a large impact is peer mentoring, which we will propose uh, will be a project in collaboration with the Mental Health Network. Now, examples of projects that the previous years um, have done, including bespoke school planners that contain detailed well-being advice and sample CBT worksheets. Also, um, one year, the Wellbeing Ambassadors redesigned the school's academic mentoring program to including well-being 
questions that all tutors were discussing with their duties on a regular basis, in addition to questions about academic progress. At the end of the intervention, we will evaluate the impact of the project and recommend whether the intervention should continue on in future years. Um, this cycle will then continue again in the next academic year when the next cohort of wellbeing ambassadors uh, picks up where we left off. Um, therefore, there is a culture of continually improving the wellbeing provision within the school um, through like a research based methodology. Uh, I think so far I've gained a Bible awareness and sensitivity to other people, particularly um, about my college peers. And the skills I'm learning now, I believe, will be crucial in my future ventures, whatever they end up being. Thank you, Sushima. That was excellent to hear about that. Um, I mean, we, we have a number of questions. We'll take them at the end. But but just picking up on that point you made there about the sort of the peer-to-peer the -peer nature of the programme, it's obviously vitally important. Um, do, you, do have you Have you found any resistance from students to participating in any of the activities that you've just described? Um, I don't think so. I think it's more about how you approach it and knowing that like confidentiality and being non-judgmental. I think if you establish those first, people are more willing to um, engage with the interventions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, with that, thank you, Sishim. We're going to we're going to move on to uh, Ben Webster, uh, who is uh, the school's deputy head pastoral, long-serving deputy head pastoral. Ben, um, you've been absolutely fundamental to the design, development, and execution of this program. Uh, I think you're going to take us through um, through the, the sort of five takeaways that we would like to leave uh, viewers with. But, but maybe you could just spend a moment sort of talking about how the programme has evolved over the course of, of the last several years. Yeah, of course. So I've uh, worked at LAE uh, now for nine years and it's been wonderful actually to see how we've developed over that time a real culture of kindness and well-being. And I think it comes and I'll, I'll talk about this in a moment when we talk about some of the five steps, but it, it, it really comes from that culture of continually improving effectiveness within the school. So being able to understand what the needs are in the student body um, and being open and honest about those needs so that you then just try things, try initiatives, see what works, have those impact measures. Um, and if you do that over time, you will see um, success and you will see culture change in the way that you want to be able to direct and change it. Thank you, Ben. So what, what would we want to tell uh, other st schools about how uh, what they can learn from this process, what they might consider in their own context? Yeah, so if we were to think about what five steps that different schools and organisations could take away from this, um, the first step I would say is to dive deeply into the research. And this may vary from institution to institution and research as much as possible needs to be in the context of what that institution is in. For us, we're working with 16 to 19 year olds. So spent a lot of time delving into research around adolescent uh, mental health in particular. Um, and our, through, through the research, what we found was that there were six particular domains that um, the research demonstrated would have the most impact in increasing um, well-being and also correlated with well-being well -being attainment of the young people. So those six uh, different areas were uh, building resilience, um, ensuring student voice, and you've heard from three different students today about the importance of that, um, staff well-being. There's a direct correlation between the well-being of teachers and staff in a school and the well-being of students to actively teach well-being. So yes, it should be embedded, it should be part of the culture of the school, but we should be also teaching the students themselves what the research shows. We should be giving assemblies on what growth mindset is and how brains are changing over time. Um, we should be talking to parents and carers. We should be um, liaising with them on strategies um, that they could be using outside of a classroom. And lastly, the importance of a growth mindset um, as well. So these six things were the things that for us came out of the research that had the, uh, the most impact on um, adolescent mental health. So to quote uh, from here, from Young Advisors, this is a quote here, children and young people feeling good, feeling that life is going well and feeling able to get on with their daily lives. That's what we felt was what good well-being looked like and that's what, um, what all our strategies led towards. So firstly, the research. Secondly, taking a dispassionate view of your own school context. So it was important for us in our context to really um, honestly understand that we're a highly um, 
academic environment and there comes with that particular stresses um, that is having uh, an impact on the, our students' lives. And we needed to um, understand that and we needed to understand from the students what was it like to step into this environment, and what was it like on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to be part of a highly academic school. What we found was there were opportunities there as well. And so when embracing growth mindset principles, we found that was highly effective both in combating stress, but also in terms of responding in terms of academic resilience um, to what was happening in terms of their assessments and in the classroom. Thirdly, um, goals are, are important. It's important to set the right goals for your school community. So our research found that schools and institutions that had uh, mental well-being programs regularly achieve an 11% improvement in attainment and achievement tests, which is hugely significant. There's a 25% improvement in social and emotional skills and a 10% decrease in classroom misbehavior, anxiety and depression. So that's what the research shows. So from this, we had discussions about what were the metrics that we were going to be using to judge the success of our programs and how would we know um, if we were successful. It's very easy with well-being to do an initiative without thinking about what are the changes that you're looking for. And it's not as easy as it is by giving a classroom assessment to, uh, to measure what um, good well-being looks like. Um, fourth, um, and this is something I think is really important, is about giving the pupils real voice and real agency. We give a lot of time and resources to our student leaders. So you've heard from the Mental Health Network, you've heard from Wellbeing Ambassadors. We have a number of other different student leadership groups within the school. We have equalities groups, we have an LGBT group, our BAME group, a gender equality group, and they all have incredible responsibility within the school to bring about the type of culture that we want to see from the bottom up. So we invest a significant amount of time in training these students to be responsible leaders, giving them the skills, equipping them with the knowledge in order for them to be coached, to be successful in what they do. So the Mental Health Network um, has both been uh, key to the efficacy and also the sustainability of the programme, because what they do every year is they pass down those knowledge and those skills to the year below, creating this, uh, this virtuous cycle of improvement. And lastly, the importance of evaluating and refining. And this is something that all schools, all good schools do um, in all aspects of it, is how are you continuously improving? What are the strategies that work? What are going to be embedded? What's going to be strategically abandoned? Or what's going to be refined? So we track um, all the obvious measures in terms of mental health. So we track school attendance, behavior, um, engagement across the school. Um, we also run detailed uh, well-being surveys uh, with all students that we now have um, a huge number of years of data so we can see how things improve and change over time and what the results of the interventions are. So this gives us a very rich evidence base to draw on when we make decisions about how we refine our well-being strategies year on year. So to recap, the five steps, the research, the dispassionate view of your own school, the goals, giving student voice and agency and evaluation and refinement. Thank you, Ben. That's really fascinating. And we've got a, we've got a series of questions here that I'd, I'd like to pose primarily to the panel. Just before I do that, I, mean, I think it's several points. Uh, we've, we've honestly described the school as, a, as, a, as an academically challenging environment. Uh, and, and I think it's a, that, that is an important disclaimer. Uh, we should obviously acknowledge that, uh, that, that students in all schools uh, experience anxiety about academic performance uh, and that, uh, that that's not uh, something that is somehow peculiar to, to our environment. So that, that certainly is a, a readily transferable lesson from the LAE context. Uh, but I'm going to start with uh, actually a really interesting question that came in towards the end of the presentation there, which is around uh, the extent to which we tackle the underlying causes of uh, mental health issues or whether there's any work that we do from a preventative perspective. Um, I'm actually going back to Ben first. Uh, ben, do you think, I mean, obviously we could we could answer this in a number of ways, uh, but, but I think maybe if you take a run at it first. 
Yeah, I'll be interested to hear what, what the students say as well. I, I think there's, I did an assembly um, last week about locus of control um, and the importance for students to understand you know, wh where they are. Could they there be some more things that they have control over or are they actually asking too much? And I think that the same question um, we should ask as school leaders as well. There's clearly things, <clears throat> excuse me, that's outside of our locus of control in what we're able to change in terms of broader societal disadvantage. Uh, but there may well be uh, things within our locus of control that we can influence more. And I think what we found in particular is that and there's things that we could be doing with parents and carers that we weren't doing before in order to have influence of what home environment could look like, uh, for example. Um, and there's also things that we were able to learn from students about what their experience is. For example, you know, social media, I imagine a lot of people, that's something that's going on in their minds right now, social media and well-being. That's something that we talk a lot to the students about in terms of about what do they think the key messages around that should be. We're dealing with um, a particular age group where we, they, they come, um, it, 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 we, we say this every year to them, they come as children, they leave as adults. So they come at 16, they leave at 18. We need to be getting them ready to be going on into university and the world of work afterwards um, by the time they leave the school. So that means this um, gradual release of responsibility over time. Um, and that does mean making sure that they're independent, they take responsibility for their actions, they're, they have you know, autonomy um, and agency. Um, so we're not going to be obviously kind of change um, some of the, the, the core things that is affecting um, well-being and mental health. But I think we've learned over time where we're able to make those nudges and those influences. Thank you. Um, we also have a question about how students have adapted to talking about mental health. And I think this is this is for the student panel. So uh, I, I'm, I'm looking for volunteers, but in, in terms of either your own feelings or uh, it, 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 with with respect to people's confidentiality, uh, those of uh, those of other students, um, have you have you or have other students experienced any particular challenges in voicing your or their feelings? Uh, would anyone like to take that? Um, I feel like for most of us, we came from schools that didn't really speak about mental health as much as LAE does. So there were some challenges possibly at the start when people would come and they would say things and they understood from the get go that this isn't an environment to say those kind of things. And we, we really focus on educating people as much as we can about mental health and the implications that their words can have. So sometimes people might use derogatory terms about mental health or speak about mental health um, conditions such as depression or anxiety very lightly. But I feel like this school focuses a lot on educating students on the real implications that it can have on people and their lives. And so through that way, we're able to combat some things and if people are able to adapt better. Oh, that's really helpful, Alham. Thank you. I mean, I, I think that that's actually introduced a, an element of the context that I didn't address at the outset. Maybe I should have, uh, and that's that um, Ellie, because of the age of our students, they're, they're towards the end of their secondary education. Uh, we draw students from over a hundred secondary schools, uh, and whilst that is on the one hand, you know, it's a challenge. I mean, we we have uh, we have a challenge in terms of the number of schools we have to maintain active relationships with. Uh, we have an immediate challenge of forging a cohesive cohort uh, from groups of of students who typically, yeah, you know, they might know one or two other students in their year group prior to joining us. Uh, it's also a real opportunity for exactly for issues like this. It's a real opportunity to establish culture, uh, to set norms that will quickly be adopted by young people that perhaps. Uh, would be less quickly adopted if uh, if uh, more students came from one location or from one background uh, with a sort of settled way of being around one another, just, just by way of context there. Uh, okay, so uh, just also thinking about the questions that we received so far, there's more of a sort of me mechanical question, but I think it's, I think it's useful to take this. Um, uh, what are the sorts of things that go into our newsletter? Uh, and do we think that those could be shared more widely? Um, I suppose if I go to Ben, since he puts the newsletter together. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll pass back on to, over to students um, in, in a second and they, they can give some of the um, kind of what, what, you know, what the tips are. But I think they, you know, they, they look at some of the, the trending articles that um, are in the media. They look at um, a particular well-being trip uh, tip, something that is easy and practical to try out. Um, and 
um, they look at a particular piece of research um, about well-being better than advertised. But yeah, I mean, it's something that we only do internally. But I think that's an interesting idea about how is you know, the work, and we're doing a lot of work about this, potentially disseminated um, much wider than just our school. What other things have you, have you put into it? Do you remember? We do trending, yeah. media, we put stuff about science sometimes. Basically, every um, section that we do, we just link it back to mental health mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, mental health is like the foundation of everything that we do. So you can link anything back to mental health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, trending, science, media. Uh, that's exactly right. And actually, I mean, if, I, if, um, again, you have distilled into a sentence uh, much better than I could have uh, exactly the sort of philosophy that we've, pro we've we've taken to this topic, which is mental health is foundational to everything else that we do in the school. Uh, it has to weave throughout everything that we do in the school in order that young people can feel as positive as they possibly can about themselves, about their environment, about the, their future. Uh, and, the, and that uh, is the, I suppose, is the single most important factor in determining the prospects of success over the course of what is after all quite a short period of time that they spend in in our care uh, so thank you for that that's been excellent okay so uh, i think we've we've a number of other questions but i think i think we've addressed those uh, i hope that we have shared something which has been useful possibly thought provoking uh, certainly strategies that can transcend our very particular context uh, and maybe uh, be of use to schools in wildly different contexts. Uh, it's important to say we are, we are in terms of the development of all of these strategies and our, our growth as a school, uh, we are extremely keen uh, to work with other schools, uh, be those schools in the UK or further afield, uh, in order to share some of this work that's been done here. We see ourselves very much as a sort of an incubator in, in sort of tech terms. Uh, we're not trying to hold on to the IP here, we're trying to share the IP uh, because we think that it has, uh, has real value to young people everywhere. Uh, I want to thank everybody who has joined online. I want to thank everyone who submitted a question. Uh, they've been thought provoking. It's been really helpful, really interesting. Uh, and I'm sure that everyone is looking forward to many of the other uh, phenomenally interesting presentations that will be given by some really extraordinary schools from around the world as part of World Education Week. And with that, uh, I will thank you all and uh, I'll let you move on to your day. Thank you. And uh, thank you from the panel and from my colleague, Mr. Webster. Uh, have a great rest of World Education Week.